The Call of Cthulhu, found among the papers of the late Francis Whelan Thurston of Boston. Of such great powers or beings, there may be conceivably a survival, a survival of a hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested, perhaps in the shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity, forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods, monsters, mythical being of all sorts and kinds. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all of its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining its own directions, have hitherto harmed us little. But some day, the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or free from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle, wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood, if not masked by a bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the simple glance of forbidden aeons, which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things. In this case, an old newspaper item in the notes of a dead professor. I hope no one else will accomplish this piecing out. Certainly, if I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part that he knew and that he would have destroyed his nose had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926-27 to with the death of my great uncle George Gamble Angle, Professor Emeritus of the Semantic Languages at Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. Professor Angle was widely known as the authority of ancient inscriptions and had frequently been resorted to by the heads of prominent museums so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat, falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled by a nautical-looking crewmate who had come from one of his queer dark courts in the precipitous hillside, which formed a shortcut from the waterfront to the deceased home in William Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded after perplexed debate that some obscure liaison of the heart, induced by the brisk ascent of a so steep a hill by so elderly a man, was responsible for the end. At the time, I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but latterly I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder. As my granduncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness, and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will be later published by the American Archaeological Society, but there was one box which I found most exceedingly puzzling, and which I felt much averse from shewing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor carried always in his pockets. Then, indeed, I succeeded in opening it, but when I did so seemingly only to be confronted by the greater and more closely locked barrier, for what could be the meaning of the queer clay bass relief and the disjointed jottings, ramblings, and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle, in his latter years, become credulous of the most superficial impostures? I resolved to search out the eccentric sculptor responsible for this apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The bass relief was a rough rectangle less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing, and writing of some kind the bulk of these designs certainly to be, 
though my memory, despite much familiarity with the papers and collections of my uncle, failed in any way to identify this particular species, or even to hint at its remotest affiliations. Above these apparent hieroglyphs was a figure of evidently pictorial intent. Though its impersonistic execution forbade a very clear idea of its nature, it seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which seemed only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacle head surmounted a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole thing which made it most shockingly frightful. Beneath the figure was a vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. The writing accompanying this oddity was, aside from the stack of press cuttings in Professor Angle's most recent hand, and made no pretense to the literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed Cthulhu Cults, in characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. The manuscript was divided into two sections, the first of which was headed 1925, Dream and Dream Work of H. A. Wilcox, 7 Thomas Street, Providence, R.I., and the second, Narrative of Inspection John R. Legrasse, 121 Bienville Street, New Orleans, L.A., at 1908 A.A.S. M.T.G. Notes on same on Professor Webb's account. The other manuscript papers were all brief notes, some of them accounts of the queer dreams of different persons, some of them citations from theosophical books and magazines, notably W. Scott Elliott's Atlantis and the Lost Lemura, and the rest comments on long-surviving secret societies and hidden cults, with references to passages in such mythological and anthropological sources as Fraser's Golden Burrow and Miss Murray's Witch Cult in Western Europe. Cuttings largely alluded to mental illness and the outbreaks of group folly, or mania in the spring of 1925. The first half of the principal manuscript told a very peculiar tale. It appears that on March 1st, 1925, a thin, dark man of neurotic and excited aspect had called upon the Professor Angle, bearing the singular clay bass relief, which was then exceedingly damp and fresh. His card bore the name of Henry Anthony Wilcox, and my uncle had recognized him as the youngest son of an excellent family slightly known to him who had latterly been studying the sculpture of Rhode Island School of Design and living alone in the Flair du Lys building near that institution. Wilcox was a precious youth of known genius for greater eccentricity and had from childhood excited attention through the strange stories and odd dreams he was in the habit of relating. He called himself physically hypersensitive, but the staid folk of the ancient commercial city dismissed him as merely queer, never mingling with much of his kind. He had dropped gradually from social visibility, and was now only known to a small group from other towns. Even at the Providence Art Club, anxious to preserve its conservatism, had found him quite hopeless. On the occasion of the visit ran the professor's manuscript. The sculptor abruptly asked him for the benefit of his host's archaeological knowledge in identifying the hieroglyphs on the bas relief. He spoke in a dreamy, stilted manner which suggested Poe's and alienated sympathy, and my uncle, shewed some sharpness in replying, for the conspicuous freshness of the tablet implied kinship with anything but archaeology. Young Wilcox's rejoinder, which impressed my uncle enough to make him recall and record verbatism, was a fantastically poetic cast, which must have typified his whole conversation, and which I have found highly characteristic of him. He said, It is new, indeed, for I made it last night in a dream of strange cities, and dreams are older than the brooding tire, or the contemplative sphinx, or garden-girdled Babylon. It was then that he began rambling a tale which suddenly played upon a sleeping memory and won the fevered interest of my uncle. There had been a slight earthquake tremor the night before, the most considerable felt in New England for years, and Wilcox's imagination had been keenly affected. Upon retiring, he had an unprecedented dream of great cyclopean cities of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths, all dripping with green ooze and sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics had covered the walls and pillars, and from some undetermined point below had come to a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation 
which only fancy could transmute into a sound, but which attempted to render the almost unpronounceable jumble of the letters Cthulhu Fatang. Cthulhu Fatang. Cthulhu Fatang? Fatang. Cthulhu Fatagen. Fatagen. Cthulhu Fatagen. Unpronounceable jumbles of letters Cthulhu Fatagen. This verbal jumble was the key to the recollection which excited and disturbed Professor Angle. He questioned the sculptor with scientific minuteness and studied with almost frantic intensity the vast relief on which the youth had found himself working, chilled and clad only in his nightclothes, when waking had stolen bewilderingly over him. My uncle blamed his old age, Wilcox afterwards said, for his slowness in recognizing both hieroglyphics and pictorial design. Many of his questions seemed highly out of place to his visitor, especially those which tried to connect the latter with strange cults or societies, and Wilcox could not understand the repeated promises of silence, which he was offered in exchange for an admission of membership in some widespread mystical or pagnally religious body. When Professor Engel became convinced that the sculptor was indeed ignorant of any cult or system of cryptic lore, he besieged his visitor with demands for future reports of dreams. This bore regular fruit, for after the first interview, the manuscript records daily calls of the young man, during which he related startling fragments of nocturnal imagery whose burden was always some terrible cyclopean vista of dark and dripping stone, with a subterranean voice or intelligence shouting monotonously an enigmatical sense uninscribable save as gibberish. The two sounds most frequently repeated are those rendered by the letters Cthulhu and Ryleth. On March 23rd, the manuscript continued. Wilcox failed to appear, and inquiries at his quarters revealed that he'd been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and taken to the home of his family in Waterman Street. He had cried out in the night, arousing several other artists in the building, and had manifested since then only alterations of unconsciousness and delirium. My uncle had once telephoned the family, and from that time forward kept a close watch of the case, calling often as Thaler Street office of Dr. Toby, whom he learned to be in charge. The youth's verbile mind apparently was dwelling on strange things, and the doctor shuddered now, and then spoke of them. They included not only a repetition of what he had formerly dreamed, but touched wildly on a gigantic thing, miles high, which walked or lumbered about. He at no time fully described this object, but occasional frantic words, as repeated by Dr. Toby, convinced the professor that it must be identical to the nameless monstrosity he had sought to depict in his dream sculpture. Reference to this object, the doctor added, was invariably a prelude to the young man's substance into lethargy. His temperature, oddly enough, was not greatly above normal, but his whole condition was otherwise as to suggest a true fever rather than a mental disorder. On April 2nd at about 3 p.m., every trace of Wilcox's malady suddenly ceased. He sat upright in bed, astonished to find himself at home and completely ignorant of what had happened in the dream or reality since the night of March 22nd. Pronounced well by his physician, he returned to his quarters in three days, but to Professor Angle, he was of no further assistance. All traces of strange dreaming had vanished with his recovery, and my uncle kept no record of his night thoughts after a week of pointless and irrelevant accounts of thoroughly usual visions. Here, the first part of the manuscript ended, but references to certain of the scattered notes gave me much material for thought. So much, in fact, that the only ingrained skepticism then forming my philosophy can account for my continued distrust of the artist. The notes in question were those depicted of dreams of various persons covering the same period as that in which young Wilcox had had strange visitations. My uncle, it seemed, had quickly instituted the prodigiously far-flung bodies of inquiries amongst nearly all the friends whom he could question without impertinence, asking for nightly reports of their dreams and the dates of any notable vision for some time past. The reception of his request seems to have been varied, but he must have, at the very least, have received more responses than any ordinary man could have handled without a secretary. The original correspondent was not preserved, but his notes formed a thoroughly and really significant digest. Average people in society and business, New England's traditional salt of the earth, gave an almost completely negative results, though scattered cases of uneasy but formless nocturnal impressions appear here and there, always between March 23rd and April 2nd, the period of young Wilcox's delirium. 
scientific men were a little more affected. The four cases of vague description suggest fugitive glances of strange landscapes, and in one case there was mention of dread of something abnormal. It was from the artists and poets that the pertinent answers came, and I know that panic would have broken loose had they been able to compare notes. As it was, lacking their original letters, I half suspected the compiler of having asked those leading questions, or of having edited the correspondence in corroboration with what he had latently resolved to see. That is why I continued to feel that Wilcox, somehow cognizant of the old data which my uncle had possessed, had been imposing on the veteran scientist. These responses told a very disturbing tale. From February 28th to April 2nd, a large proportion of them had dreamed very bizarre things, and the intensity of the dreams being immeasurably stronger during the period of the sculptor's delirium. Over a fourth of those who had reported anything reported scenes and half-sounds, not unlike those which Wilcox had described, and some of the dreamers confessed acute fear of the gigantic nameless thing visible towards the last. One case, which the note describes with emphasis, was very sad. The subject, a widely known architect with leanings of the theosophy and the occultism, went violently insane on the date of young Wilcox's seizure, and expired several months later after incessant screamings to be saved from some escaped denizen of hell. Had my uncle referred to these cases by name instead of merely by number, I should have attempted some corroboration and personal investigation, but as it was, I succeeded in tracing down only a few. All of these, however, bore out the notes in full. I have often wondered if all of the objects of the professor's questioning felt as puzzled as did this fraction. It is well no explanation shall ever reach them. The press cuttings, as I have intimated, touched on cases of panic, mania, and eccentricity during the given period. Professor Angle must have employed a cutting bureau for a number of extracts was tremendous, and the sources scattered throughout the globe. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London, where a lone sleeper had leaped from a window after a shocking cry. Here, likewise a rambling letter to the editor of a paper in South America, where a fanatic deduces a dire future from the visions he has seen. A dispatch from California describes a theosophist colony as donning white robes and masks for some glorious fulfillment which never arrives, whilst items from India speak guardedly of a serious native unrest towards the end of March. Voodoo orgies multiply in Haiti, and African outposts report ominous mutterings. American officers in the Philippines find certain tribes bothersome about this time, and the New York policemen are mobbed by hysterical Levantians on the night of March 22nd to 23rd. The west of Ireland, too, is full of wild rumor and legendary, and a fantastic painter named Ardios Bonnet hangs a blasphemous dream landscape in the Paris Spring Salon of 1926. And so numerous are the recorded troubles of insane asylums that only a miracle could have stopped the medical fraternity from noting strange parallelisms and drawing mystified conclusions. A weird bunch of cuttings, all told, and I can at this date scarcely envisage the callous rationalism with which I set them aside. But I was then convinced that young Wilcox had known of the older matters mentioned by the professor.